All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well today. Welcome to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum's Winter 2023 Lecture Series. We're really happy to have everybody with us today um, on this sunny May, May, March afternoon. Um, I'm Elizabeth York. I am the museum's executive director. Today's lecture is sponsored, of course, by the Mid-Cape Cultural Council and the Mass Cultural Council, as well as our 2023 corporate sponsors. Uh, those are Cape Air, Highline Cruises, and Avangrid. A big thank you to them for their generous support of the museum. It's really worth noting as well that programs like this lecture today are made possible by support from folks like yourselves watching here today. I really urge you to consider becoming a member or donating. Your membership and donations help us host programs like these and many others. So please consider donating today to keep these programs going. Uh, before we get started, just a few reminders about our Zoom lecture format. Please be sure to turn off your microphone and keep your video off as well so that all of our attention can be on our wonderful speaker today. If you run into any technical issues, please feel free to send me a message via the chat function that's on that bottom uh, toolbar in Zoom. Also, if you have a question for today's speaker, you can type that into the Q&A option and you can type that in at any time, but our speaker will be taking questions at the end. So uh, please feel free to put it in at any point, but we'll, she will be taking questions at the end. So uh, without further ado, Maddie has worked for the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy in multiple roles since 2020 and is currently the community educator for the organization. Maddie uh, attended Elon University in North Carolina where she studied environmental science and education and she always helps enjoying people of all ages learn all about the ocean and the species that inhabit it so maddie take it away awesome thanks so much for the introduction elizabeth and thank you everyone for having me today i'm thrilled to be talking to you all um, about white sharks and about the work that we do so like elizabeth said i'm the community educator with the atlantic white shark conservancy if you're not familiar with us yet, you definitely will be over the next hour or so as I'm talking about all the work that we do and all the things that we've learned through that work. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. Just get us started. Awesome. So, oops, I'm going crazy. There it is. So like I said, we're going to be talking a lot about these guys right here. So these are, of course, white sharks. They are very abundant here in our oceans right off of Cape Cod. And it is likely that there are a lot of varying opinions about this species on this call today. So anywhere you go, especially here on Cape Cod, it's pretty likely that you'll run into any number of people who have any number of opinions about white sharks and about their role in the ecosystem. And I hope that I can inform those opinions for you today. This map here depicts all of the different shark sightings that have been confirmed around this area. So this is the region that we are working with with the population of white sharks. It's considered the Northwest Atlantic Ocean all along our coastline. And this map specifically is looking at throughout the 1980s. So it depicts the fact that sharks have always been in this area and they have been for a very long time. They're not new to our area at all. If you kind of focus right around where Cape Cod is, find us on our coastline, find Massachusetts on our coastline, you'll see a lot of those little green dots, but you'll also see that there's a pretty big span from all the way up on the coast of Canada to all the way through and into the, the Gulf of Mexico. Now, as I said, they've always been a part of our ecosystem here. Sightings and stories date back as far as to the 1800s, but are also pretty popular in throughout the 1900s as well. This photo here was taken in the 1940s, and there are lots of written records, photos, as well as fishing documentation of white sharks in our ecosystem. I mentioned back in the 1800s, famous author Henry David Thoreau wrote of white sharks, at the lighthouse, both in East Ham and Truro, the only houses quite on the shore, they declared that next year they would not bathe there for any sum, for they sometimes saw sharks tossed up and quiver for the moment on the sand. I have no doubt that one shark in a dozen years is enough to keep up the reputation of a beach 100 miles long. And he wrote that in 1865. So it's no joke that these sharks have been here for quite some time. But what our scientists are trying to understand is why. And over time, they have theorized the causes of this population's presence in the area and have drawn a pretty linear connection between the gray seals and the sharks. 
Gray seals are the primary food source for white sharks in this region, so they have a very close-knit history to the white sharks. And our scientists believe that the more seals in the area have led to a lot more sharks present and hunting off of our coastline. In the 1800s throughout the 1960s, the gray seal population was diminished greatly by human intervention. Fishermen saw the seals as threats to their stock. Beachgoers saw them as a nuisance crowding the areas they like to recreate. And because of this, there were actually bounties put in place on the seals. For every seal nose that someone brought into town hall, they would receive between two and a half and five dollars. And especially dating back to the 1800s, that was a good sum of money. Folks actually started to make their livelihoods just from hunting seals. So some people who might have been fishermen in the past realized that the seal abundance was a lot better for their livelihood than the fish. And the species absolutely felt the effects, but it wasn't just that population that felt the effects. It was the entire ecosystem. The gray seal population went from what we believe to be similar to today's numbers of between 30 and 50,000 down to nearly nothing. It was estimated at one point in time that there were fewer than 100 gray seals in the entire Northwest Atlantic Ocean. Pretty big impact that we were having. And one of the scariest parts about that time with the bounty was that there was no tracking put in place at all. So we don't actually know exactly the damage that we had, but we saw the species cut down to near extinction. Luckily, the state of Massachusetts took note of the historic species vanishing from our waters and installed statewide protections on the species in 1965, which ended the bounties and we're hoping to see restoration to the gray seal population. In addition to statewide protections, the federal government enacted the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 which was to prevent harm and hunting to a multitude of different marine mammal species in federal or state waters, ranging from whales to seals to manatees and more. This gave room for the gray seal population to really begin its regrowth. Just as the marine mammals began their journey to repopulation, bad news was coming about for the white shark population. So they already had diminished access to a steady food source in the area, but with the 1975 release of the movie Jaws, it inspired a lot of people to be just like Quint in the film. And if you're unfamiliar with the movie, definitely recommend watching it. But Quint is the fisherman who is hunting down monster sharks in the movie and hoping to prove their worth as a fisherman by catching the biggest, baddest shark in the ocean. So already with a depleted food source, sharks were now, white sharks specifically, were now under threat from recreational fishing. What we saw in this period of time were that white sharks were being taken out of the ecosystem at an alarmingly rapid rate. And while the population at this time was unknown, there were some estimates by scientists that 80% of the white shark population was removed from the waters during this time period. Fishing tournaments for sharks are still legal in other parts of the world. And in the 1970s and 80s, people flocked to Cape Cod to partake in these types of events, which is where we saw the multitude of sharks being removed from their environment. The impact on the ecosystem was definitely hard to ignore. Um, and in 1997, excuse me, great white sharks were designated as a federally prohibited species in the US Atlantic Ocean. So that meant that we could no longer be fishing or hunting for them commercially or recreationally. And it's because of these protections that we slowly began to see the white shark and gray seal populations in hand return to the area where they historically had always been. A few years come past, in 2004, Dr. Greg Skomel of the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries responded to a call about a 14-foot white shark, who was na later named Gretel, that was trapped in a salt pond on Noshon Island. This incident had prompted the DMF to begin its work with white sharks, led by Dr. Skomel. And then shortly after, in 2005, that is when Massachusetts followed up the federal prohibited prohibitations on white shark hunting and designated the white sharks as a protected species, reinforcing those federal guidelines within Massachusetts state waters. We know him, we love him, Dr. Greg Skomal, shark tagger extraordinaire. After beginning the white shark program with the state in 2004, his work really led to white shark research picking up, especially later in years such as 2009, which is where the tagging program really began to get on his feet. After that first incident with that white shark Gretel in the salt pond, Dr. Skomel realized, you know, these sharks are here. They haven't been for a really long time, but we're seeing that population regrow. We're seeing them back. We can do work here. We can study them. We got to. So that's what really inspired him to do that work. And in order to do so, he received a permit from the state to be working with those sharks. And shortly into it, he realized just how much funding would be necessary to keep the work afloat. 
And that's where we come in. So we were founded in 2012 as a nonprofit organization to fund and support Dr. Skolmo's white shark research. We developed a mission with three main pillars, conducting and supporting that white shark research in the area, bridging the gap between research and public safety, and educating the public. The work that we do features white sharks because of the proximity to the ongoing research and population, as well as the species importance to the ecosystem. I'm gonna throw us back to middle school science class for a second. Um, you might be familiar with the term apex predator, something that we learned you know, really early on in schooling, and it's something that is still very important that we talk about today. We learned about apex predators as we learned about the structure of ecosystems. And you may remember that apex predators are at the tippity top of the food chain. They run the show. They are number one head honcho, king and queen of the ecosystem. As such, their health is impacted by the health of the entire ecosystem, every tiny little thing, not only the food that they're directly consuming, but even the tiniest plankton at the very bottom of the food chain. So they are really indicative of the overall ocean ecosystem health. And therefore, a presence of white sharks for us indicates a really healthy ocean ecosystem. They wouldn't be here and they definitely wouldn't be here in a growing population if we didn't have a very healthy ocean ecosystem. And a healthy ocean ecosystem not only means more sharks, but it also means healthy fish, healthy seals, and all the other species that inhibit and inhabit that area. area. Excuse me. Um, but it also means happy humans. Let's not forget how heavily we, especially here around Cape Cod and Massachusetts, rely on our oceans. And people all over the country and all over the world rely on oceans, whether it's for jobs, food, or just fun and recreation. A healthy ocean is really good for us, too. But in order to have a balanced ecosystem, we need these species to be existing in their natural range. We talked about how they had been driven away from their natural range while their food source was also being hunted, and while they themselves felt the pressure of fishing. This map here actually depicts where white sharks naturally occur in the ocean around the world. And you'll notice that it's pretty widespread. They have a really wide range depending on where they are. And that Cape Cod, that tiny little dot on the east coast of the US, is considered a hot spot for white shark activity. So while we're talking about the population of white sharks that our research team and Dr. Scomel are studying, it's not just the Cape Cod population. It's not just the Massachusetts population. It truly is the Northwest Atlantic population as it spans from Canada down to Florida and Gulf of Mexico, as we saw in that earlier map depiction. And it's possible that these sharks are traveling even further. That's one of the things that our team is trying to understand is just how far that different populations can go. It is important to note that if you look at the other hotspots around the world, researchers do believe that there are different populations of white sharks at each one of those different hotspots. So you'll see that there is one over on the west coast of the United States, the Pacific um, population. We then also can head down to the South African area, as well as around Australia and New Zealand. Um, so the, while the range is definitely widespread, there are multiple populations around the world. And with this information, we are working to ensure the continued success of the ecosystem through that research and conservation. So by focusing on the apex predator in the ecosystem, we hope to benefit the entire thing as a whole. And over the last 13 years, which sounds crazy to say, but time just keeps on ticking, um, that has expanded as we've worked to answer the many questions that we and everyone have been asking about white sharks. And our goal for the past few years and at present is just to answer the two most pressing questions, which are how many white sharks are there? Where are they going? And to answer these questions, we have two different ongoing research studies at play, which are our movement study and the population study. In 2013, the population study began to answer the question of how many white sharks there are in our waters. And this is our staff scientist, Megan Winton. She actually began this program as part of her PhD. And hopefully very soon, she will be successful in defending that PhD. So she is gearing up to do that very soon. Um, she is in a program at UMass Dartmouth. And so she has been working alongside some other researchers in that area as well to do the population study as well as a myriad of other things in her research. And she does this population study in a few different ways. And the first is by gathering underwater video footage of individual white sharks, which if this video wants to play, and wait, okay, that's right. Um, 
So by gathering underwater video footage of individual white sharks, the team can piece together kind of the who's who of the white shark population and get an estimate of how many white sharks there are that call this area home. Megan specifically works with data and models, including writing her own code, building her own unique model to understand the population. Video footage is collected by positioning the boat near a shark and then using the GoPro camera on a very long pole to film the shark as it swims naturally through the water. Now, you'll remember that white sharks are protected by the state and federally, and any interaction that makes contact with the animal must be under proper permitting by the state. And while our cameras don't touch the shark, we do ensure that the animal is freely swimming and never under any duress while we are filming or conducting research. And so these videos, like such on your screen, is an example of the kind of content that we gather through this study. So seeing, seeing the shark up close and personal can allow us to familiarize ourselves with its unique features, understand a little bit more about how it's moving through the water, maybe what it's doing while we're observing it, and really just get a better idea of all different kinds of things. If I can get the next video to play. So as we look at this shark up close and personal, we can see a lot more of the detail along its body, things that we might not see if we were just looking at the shark from the top down on the boat. Okay, and this is how our research team does it. They pull stills and screenshots from the video footage, and the research team then creates a shark ID card for each one of the individual sharks that we encounter, like such on the screen. They look at specific features on the shark's body, such as the gill slits, the head, dorsal fin, pelvic fins, and caudal fin, and piece together these cards. They also include the stats about the shark, including its sex, tag date, if applicable, ID date, length, and any special notes regarding maybe the shark's name or behavior or anything else that they noticed while they were interacting with that individual. So by piecing together these kind of ID cards in what we call our catalog, they can understand better about each one of the individuals and when they come across new unidentified sharks, perhaps make a match or identify that shark as new. So each shark has unique markings, colorations, scars, injuries that can be used to help our team identify them. The team will often name the individuals after their markings, such as white shark candy cane, shown here. Our team thought that the white markings on the shark's tail is shaped a bit like a candy cane. So sometimes our team gets to be a little creative with it. Sometimes sharks are also named after a behavior that they may have been exhibiting. For example, white shark turbo was very speedy. He was actually kind of running circles around the boat in a more playful demeanor, swimming really quickly and trying to kind of outrun the boat in a few ways. So based on that behavior, they named him white shark turbo. He also has a very smiley photo in the bottom corner. White sharks can also be named, click, there we go after people like white shark Brian K. Arsenault, who is named in honor of U.S. Army Specialist Brian Arsenault, who was killed in action in 2014. Oftentimes, our sharks also get their names from donors. So for a donation, folks can submit a name for an individual white shark. The shark seen here is white shark Cool Beans, who was named by the Sturge family for their family dog. And through the population study, our team has been able to identify over 600 individual sharks by comparing new footage of these sharks to the catalog of shark IDs like we already have. So if just by looking at these past four sharks that I've looked at, you think, wow, they all look the same. Imagine our research team going through that catalog of over 600. And by this point, they're really good at it. They can sometimes see a video or a, a photo of an individual shark and know who it is almost instantly. They have an insane amount of skill when it comes to identifying white sharks. But the coolest part about it is that it's not just our research team who gets to access these shark ID cards. They're actually completely accessible on the white shark logbook, which is located on our website. So if you ever get bored and want to explore some sharks or just are interested in learning more about the research and the work that we do, you can go through that database of over 600 sharks. And you might be wondering why we bother to name the shark. And it is mostly so our research team can have a little bit of fun, but it's also because if you had to go through that database of over 600 sharks and refer to them as white shark 34416, you would also want to give them names. Definitely keeps us young. <laughs> so by identifying these individuals, like I've said, we've been learning a lot about the population, not only about what kinds of things they might be interacting with, but also about you know, how they might be interacting with each other, how many sharks are there, and hopefully soon we will have a proper estimate to that, uh, 
question. But another question still remains, and that is, where are they going? So Dr. Scomo, oh, this has sound. We'll just let it play. Okay. Um, so Dr. Scomo began tagging white sharks to track their movements and to understand how they're using our coastline. And our team is working to continue those tagging efforts. So that video really showed just how quickly the tagging process happens. As long as well as the collection of underwater video footage, the shark is always freely swimming when we are conducting the tagging research. So we rely on a spotter pilot to find the sharks and to guide the boat captain to them. And when they are about one to two feet from the surface of the water, so they do have to be kind of pretty close up to the surface, Dr. Skoma will place that tag. And the tags that we're using are primarily called acoustic tags. That's a photo of them over on the left. They operate really similarly to the easy pass system that you might have in your car. So when you drive under a toll booth, the transponder in your car will communicate with the toll booth and the toll then is notified of who you are and the date and time that you were there. And when a shark with an acoustic tag on it swims within range of one of our acoustic receivers, the photo in the middle, we will get a notification or we will have a detection of that individual shark. And we have over a hundred of those different um, receivers around the coast of Cape Cod and Massachusetts. And we also have some collaborators who have put receivers in place along the coast of New Hampshire and Maine as well. The receiver then will detect the sound wave given off by the tag, which is where it gets its name, acoustic, and will record information about the shark, such as the unique tag ID number and date and time that it was there. And with this study, we can understand a greater amount of data when it comes to the entire population. So we can kind of build out a map or build out a certain pathway of where the individual sharks are going, when they're there, and where they maybe show up the most. So those tags, like I said, are attached to the shark with an intramuscular dart. So it just goes right under the base of the skin, right at the, at the base of the dorsal fin, just as you saw in the video. And so far, our team has placed over 260 tags on individual white sharks. And so you'll notice that 260 is not quite 600. We have not tagged every shark that we've identified. We have not identified every shark that we have tagged. We definitely have not tagged or identified every shark in the Atlantic Ocean yet. We'll see. So with the, with the data that we collect from the receivers, like I said, we're putting together kind of a map of where these tagged sharks are going and where they are spending most of their time. And we can filter that information in a number of ways. Shown here, again, is our white shark logbook. So not only does it have the catalog of all the identified individuals, but you can also then view the detection data, which dates all the way back to 2009 when tagging began. We expect to have 2022 tag detection data out within the next month or and a half or so. Our team is still filtering through some of that receiver data and hoping to push that out um, ideally in April, but hopefully in the next month or so. So definitely if you're interested on learning about 2022 receiver data, check out our site. So our data can be explored in a number of ways. So we see a map here, this is the all detections for 2021, but you can explore the data by looking at an individual receiver. So if you are a receiver sponsor or if you're interested in the receiver that maybe is off of a beach that you frequent, you can check out the information there, which individuals like to come in that area, how many times have there been detections in that area and so on and so forth. You can also sort the tag detection data by individual shark. You can look at by shark sex, where do males versus females or unknowns like to go, by shark size, maybe where some of our larger sharks spend their time comparatively to the smaller sharks that we've seen, or we can filter it out by year and month. So we can allow ourselves as well as anyone who's interested to dive further into the information that we're learning and really kind of explore what that information means for us. So it's important to remember, like I said, that we have not tagged every shark in the ocean and that these receivers will only detect white sharks that have been tagged with an acoustic tag. Alongside with this great detection data, we've been gaining a better understanding of not only where the sharks are going, but also how they're interacting with the coastline while they're there. We've been recently involved in a study that found that white sharks in this area spend almost 50% of their time in less than 15 feet of water. And before you ask why, your answer is in this photo. You can see that gray seals play, swim, and feed in the waters just outside the wave break off of our beaches. And as the white shark's primary food source, it's no wonder why these predators are patrolling close to the beach. This means that we are often working with sharks pretty close to shore, as shown in this photo here, where our research vessel, the Aleutian Dream, 
is just off of a public beach. And this tends to make quite the spectacle when it happens, drawing crowds on the beach and causing lots of questions and possibly some fear as well. However, as a natural part of the shark's habitat, getting close to shore is also a natural part of our work. But it's also really important to us that we help people understand why it happens and what we're doing so that we can kind of control a lot of that fear and questions because we know that it puts a lot on our lifeguards who might not have the answers that they're looking for. So as the movement study and tagging efforts have continued over the years, we've also begun to develop new questions which need new methods and equipment to answer them. And what you see in this photo is called a CATS tag, which stands for Customized Animal Tracking Solution. And this tag allows to get even more information about what the shark may be doing as it swims throughout the water. These tags can collect a myriad of data points, looking at environmental factors such as water depth and temperature, as well as the way the shark is moving. They have an accelerometer within the tags that will Sorry. They have an accelerometer within the tags, which is the same type of tech that might be in your Fitbit or Apple Watch that kind of tracks your steps and heart rate. And this can also tell us when the shark is speeding up, slowing down, changing direction, and more. It's almost like if you do have one of those Fitbits or Apple Watches and it tells you, hey, maybe go take a walk or you've been sitting for a while. It notices that your heart rate is lower. It notices that you haven't been taking steps and it will prompt you in that way. And while our cat's tags aren't telling our sharks, hey, maybe go for a run, it will also then be tracking that information to understand what the shark's behavior might be. And with all these data points, our team can create the 3D model that you see on the screen, which will depict the shark's movements over the time period that the tag was on the shark, which typically these tags will stay on the shark for anywhere up to three days. They can be kind of, um, that's what I'm looking for. They can be set on a certain time frame. So usually no more than 72 hours to get the most amount of data. Uh, most bang for our buck in that moment. But if all of that data wasn't cool enough, cat's tags also have a video camera in them which can collect up to 18 hours of footage at a time. And since the tag floats just behind the shark's dorsal fin, we actually get a sort of shark's eye view of the world underwater. Let's see if I can get this video to play. This video shows a white shark who was na later named Snoop Dogg feeding on a spiny dogfish, which is what that arrow is pointing to. The data collected from the tag shows us that Snoop Dogg was close to the bottom of the ocean, made a quick turn and some sharp head movements. And from that information, we can infer that the shark probably caught a small prey item. But until we saw the video, we didn't know what it was after and we couldn't confirm our beliefs. This video allowed us to piece together the full picture of what the shark was doing and not only what it was doing, but what it was eating. And the coolest part about this video is that this was actually the first time that scientists have been able to see and capture video of a white shark eating a spiny dogfish. We always knew, especially from necropsies back in the day, that white sharks were probably feeding on spiny dogfish. If you're unfamiliar with the species, it's a smaller species of shark that get up to be about three feet in length. They are a popular fishery here around Cape Cod as well. And we figured that since they're a part of their natural habitat, they most likely were a part of their diet as well. We had never known for sure until we saw this video. And White Shark Snoop Dogg got his name because he ate not just this spiny dogfish, but multiple of them in just a matter of minutes. And our research tech thought that that was just so silly. And so she named him Snoop Dogg. Another great aspect of the cat's tag is the fact that we are able to reuse them. So after about three days on the shark, that tag will pop off, it's on a time release, and will float to the surface where it begins to send a GPS signal for our team to go and find it. And in the past, we have been able to recover all but one of the tags that we have put out so far of this type. And that one that didn't get back was actually it popped off during a nor'easter and floated out to sea and we were unable to retrieve it. Um, by the time that last, before its battery died, um, it usually lasts another roughly between like 20 and 24 hours after it has popped off of the shark, giving us that GPS signal to come and find it. Um, the last ping before that battery died we saw was off the coast of Portugal. So as cool of a research trip as that would have been, we unfortunately were not able to go and get it. Um, but all of our tags do have our phone number and our information on them. So if by chance anyone happens to find it, hopefully they will get in contact with us. But for now, we think that one tag is kind of a lost cause. But when we do get them back, 
Oops. our team is able to offload all the data and start processing it to manage all of that data in the videos. And they will watch those videos frame by frame, second by second, to pull everything that they're noticing, not only the shark's behavior, but everything in its environment, possibly other wildlife, and just try to understand the full big picture of what that animal is doing. But in addition to using tagging as a method for understanding shark movement and behavior, our team has also begun working with drones to understand how white sharks are moving along the shallows of our coastline. Whether it be a tethered drone positioned on the beach or a mobile drone like the one in this video that may be launched from the research vessel, our research tech spent the past summer understanding how well drones can be used for spotting sharks, how they can be used for recording their movements and gaining new knowledge, and even seeing if they were able to identify individuals via drone footage. So this gives us some really awesome video footage and some really cool shots, but it also aims to show us how much we can really learn and how reliable drones may be as a method of research, as well as understanding how those sharks might be utilizing the different ins and outs shallows and sandbars that our coastline has to offer. Through the drone footage study, we have observed that not all white sharks travel the same way, nor do they all spend their time in the same place. However, we do sometimes see that multiple sharks are in one area, though it is incredibly rare to ever observe them interacting with each other. They tend to give each other a pretty wide berth when they recognize that they're in the same area. Like I said, it is something incredibly rare to witness since they are tending to be solitary and really kind of stay away from each other, even if they happen to be along the same beach. This is something that we also had the idea of, but we hadn't really ever recorded before, which shows the premise of the work that we're doing with the drones to constantly be learning something new about white sharks. One thing that we always kind of hoped that we'd be able to see is white shark on white shark interaction. You kind of have to be such a right time, right place instance, and there needs to be cause for that to happen. Since they are solitary creatures, they really don't have a reason to be interacting with each other unless it might be something like mating or a territorial debate, uh, which I've never been lucky to see our research team. I don't think many of them have ever seen white sharks interact. However, from a lot of the underwater GoPro footage that we've seen and from some of those identification cards, we have recognized and noticed some different scarring and injuries that doesn't look like some of the other injuries that some of our other sharks have gotten from boats or fishing gear or other things like seals in the ocean. So we can kind of hypothesize what those white shark on white shark interactions look like and what might be causing them. Hopefully one day we might be able to witness that and get some concrete data on it and hopefully get it on recording as well. Now, as you've seen in the many photos and videos that I've shown so far, these sharks do spend a lot of the time in their areas where people also like to recreate, right outside the wave break, within 15 feet of water, to the coast. We use our work to help establish a strong relationship with public safety officials to help use our information that we're learning from research to promote that coexistence in the water. The biggest thing that we try to help people understand is how to be aware when it comes to what's going on in the water around them. You may be familiar with these signs at beaches around Cape Cod. We help public safety officials create these signs by using the data and information that we gathered from various research projects. And by having signs on the beaches, we hope to help make beachgoers more aware that there are white sharks in the water and how to be interacting on the beach safely. One thing I do wanna note as I talk about public safety is that as a nonprofit, AWSC does not have any jurisdiction when it comes to beach protocol. We are not the ones deciding where the signs go or making the calls for swimmers out of the water. We are simply providing the people who do make those decisions with up-to-date information so that they can make the decisions that they need to make based on informed and real data. We also try to promote shark smart safety tips to give people ways to kind of remember the easy information of how to be aware of their surroundings and enjoy the beaches safely. So these tips can include things like staying away from other wildlife like fish or seals, you know, swim, surf, and more in groups and try to stay around waist deep in the water. And a lot of these things just have to do with situational awareness. And I always kind of liken it to if you're going hunting or not hunting, excuse me, if you are going hiking somewhere where there might be bears or coyotes or other wildlife that you don't particularly want to run into, um, you are made of, aware of that, whether it's by trail guides or by National Park Service or 
just by doing your due diligence and doing your research before you go to an area. So we hope that we can inspire people to do the same um, and treat the oceans the same way as they might when they're entering another wildlife habitat. Because at the end of the day, this is home for these white sharks and we are entering their environment. We wanna make sure that people can do that safely and still enjoy the beaches that they have from their entire life. Another way that we try to promote some of that awareness and some of that um, you know, shark safety thing is to with our Sharktivity app. So this is an app available on mobile phones and it's home to all the reported white shark sightings as well as the most recent year's receiver data. So if you have the app or if you don't and you open it now, you'll see all of 2021 data if you go throughout the year. Um, you'll also then see some of the sightings that have been reported. And these sightings are used primarily by our ecotourism and research team. They're putting out sightings as they're conducting their work. But it also can be used, whoops, make sure I'm in the right place. It also can be used, um, oh my goodness, I can't win today. There we go. It can be used um, by anyone. So this is a wonderful way to conduct citizen science, have everyday people getting involved, helping us gather information about white shark whereabouts, because at the end of the day, our team cannot be out on the water every day. We wish we could, but unfortunately, weather gets in the way, um, other studies and other work gets in the way. We do wear a lot of hats over at the Conservancy, so it is pretty often that we wish we could be out there, but we can't be every second. So by relying on everyday folks who might be on the beaches that day, who might be out on their boat and witness a white shark in person, we hope that we can get continue to gain information about shark whereabouts and about their behaviors as well. Now it is important that we can't do it alone. We are just one of very many organizations around the continent working to better understand the white shark population in the Northwest Atlantic, from nonprofits like us to aquarium groups, university programs, and state and federal organizations. So while the work it just definitely got started with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, and the support and funding of that work it was continued on by the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, it really does take a village. I mentioned when I was describing the acoustic receivers and where we have those that we do collaborate with other states such as New Hampshire and Maine to have more of those receivers in place. And it is something that you know comes from the local governments and comes from the interest of having them there. So by working with those different interest groups and by understanding how we can promote shark safety, and what technology might want to put different places, the more we can actually learn. So it is really important for us to have all of these different groups involved, to be, have good relationships with all different kinds of people and understanding how we can better share our information so that people can have really just a better understanding of, of what's going on and, and how they can help. So by combining, what's happening? Here we go. By combining all of the work that we are doing through research, public safety, and education, we can work within the community to engage in white shark conservation. So in addition to our app and working with public safety officials directly to help inspire some of those different things like their shark safety tips, we also have our education team who has a myriad of different ways that they are involved helping to reach out to people. So just by being on this call today and listening to me talk, you have been making yourself aware of white sharks in the area and really helping us to spread awareness. Our education team also has a summer beach outreach, outreach booth um, called the Shark Smart Beach Program, where we are on, I think this year it's five different beaches around Cape Cod, where our interns actually get the chance to interact with folks, educate them, and kind of take some of the heat off the lifeguards when questions arise because we wanna make sure that our lifeguards are doing their jobs and we can do ours in educating people and understanding the white sharks in the area. We also then have our ecotourism program, which is near and dear to my heart as it is the program that I run the most. So that is my program in addition to some of the other education programs that we work on. And it's a great way to help people understand just and connect with nature. Well, by seeing white sharks in person and by doing some of the other trips that we have that just connect with the data and the ecosystem as a whole, it can really change the way that people view it and can really create a new relationship and a new perspective on a lot of things. We also have two education facilities in Chatham and Provincetown, which are open to the public in the summer, seven days a week. And they travel, we can travel into schools, libraries, or even go virtual like I am today.
So by doing all of these different research pro or excuse me, education programs, we hope to continue to spread that awareness and keep people up to date with the information that we're learning. You know, we not only just want to talk about the amazing experiences that we've had with white sharks that show us their importance, but we also want to then share the research, the real time, what we're learning, and how that can be relevant to the people who come to listen to us talk. In doing so, we hope to inform the public so as to create conservation advocates. And that's something that I hope I've been successful so far today in doing with all of you. And with that, then there are a few ways that you can be more involved and advocate for white shark conservation. And starting with just being here today, like I said, it's the efforts of the entire community that really make a big impact. So there are a lot of ways to continue educating yourself, to continue just you know, being a part of the ecosystem in a healthy and manageable way, working on coexistence and working on understanding all the different things that go on here in our ecosystem and how you can be a part of it. So with that, I'm a fast talker. So I have kind of wrapped up my portion of this. So I will turn it back over to Elizabeth to open up the Q&A and see what questions y'all have for me. Thank you so much, Maddie. <clears throat> that was amazing. So incredibly informative. Um, Great. <laughs> I do have to say you guys also have a phenomenal social media presence as well. You guys yeah, do some thank really you. creative <laughs> things on social media. Um, My coworker, Kristen, has been having one heck of a time getting everything up and running. She's really done an amazing job since she's taken over the social media in the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, if you do all want to reach out to us um, or follow us on social media, we can be found on pretty much any platform from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even TikTok. Now you might see mm -hmm. my face there a few times <laughs> um, at a underscore white shark. You can find us pretty much anywhere. Fabulous. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. Our um, our staff at the museum loves your TikTok page. Uh, That's we, awesome. <laughs> we're always like, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I do also want to say that um, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, you guys are coming to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum for our Young Mariner program. That is going we to be the week of July 10th. That's sort of the Shark Week theme. So if you have any um, anybody in the, in the audience, if you have any kids between um, fourth grade and seventh grade or grandkids between that age, and you're going to be on the Cape that week, it's going to be sort of a shark week, uh, shark themed week, um, helped out by you guys. I mean, really led yeah. by you guys. Um, we're really looking forward to it. So yeah, our team um, is so psyched. We have um, a wonderful intern returning as our summer programs educator, as well as my coworker, Kristen, who, like I said, we all wear a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. um, so while I'll be on the water that week, you will all have two amazing educators with you. So we're yes. also very excited. <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. Yeah. Um, and I do have to say for anybody in the audience as well, uh, if you do need a really good mood booster, go to their website, look at their, um, the naming of their sharks that they have on there. It's, it's something that what, our staff, if we do need a, you know, a little pick me up, we'll check out and we'll try to see the funniest names that you guys have. Um, There's a lot of them. <laughs> charcuterie is always my favorite. That one is nice. always my favorite. We saw that right at the beginning. Um, all right. So let's jump in, um, pun intended, to some of the questions. Um, the first one we've got, and by the way, everybody, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A function. Um, you can also put them in the chat, but I think the Q&A is probably the easiest way to keep them. Um, first question we've got is, thanks very much, Maddie. Woo -hoo. Um, <laughs> he says, I'm curious to see that Greg does not wear a safety harness out on the pulpit. These sharks are, these sharks are not his personal pets, right? <laughs> as much as they are not our personal pets, they're absolutely wildlife. Dr. Skomal has many years under his belt of being out on that pulpit. He finds it very comforting, even more so than being on solid land. So don't worry about his safety. He absolutely has it under control. You will see he is wearing a life jacket at all times. So if anything were to happen, I honestly think the shark would be more spooked than he would be. Um, but he is definitely, you know, very comfortable up on that pulpit. All right. <laughs> and what age do they breed? How many pups do they normally have? How often do they have pups and how long can they live? You are asking all the right questions, my friend. So that is something white shark mating and white shark birth is actually something that around the entire world, no one has many so solid answers about. It's something that, you know, in our area, as well as along the whole Northwest Atlantic, we're hoping to learn a little bit more about and where we might be identifying some of these smaller sharks. There is a researcher off of Montauk and Long Island who has been noticing that there are routinely a lot of smaller species or smaller 
individuals of white sharks between the four foot and nine foot range, which is what we consider the juvenile. We do believe that they are born at around four or five feet in length on average. So we think that that is, you know, right around that pup size within juvenile. So by seeing a lot of sharks that size in one area, we can begin to believe that that might be a breeding ground in, in, of such. Um, however, you know, sharks being fish, they don't take care of their young. As soon as that shark's born, it comes out knowing how to eat, sleep, and swim, which is pretty much all it needs to do. <laughs> so it is on its own from the minute it is on, born. Um, so while we have actually never witnessed that anywhere in the world, nor have we ever witnessed white shark mating, um, you know, there are a lot of questions that still remain. As for how long that they live, we do have an estimate anywhere between 40 and 70 years, which I realize is a pretty wide range. Um, and that comes from a lot of the time period when sharks were being hunted heavily for recreation. So scientists were still able to learn from the sharks that were being brought out of the environment. They were able to perform necropsies, which if you're unfamiliar with the word, is like an animal autopsy. So they were able to open up the animal, try to understand you know, how old they might have been. But it is still a work in progress to understand age. We really can only get an estimate at this point. But thanks to some awesome aging estimate work done with the NOAA Fisheries Apex Predator Program and one of my friends, Dr. Michelle Pazzarotti, she is working really hard on some of that aging estimate and trying to understand at what point are they, you know, reach maturity, at what point are they fully adults. So from that, we've learned that white sharks reach maturity between 10 and 12 years, or excuse me, 10 and 12 feet, which is actually 20 to 25 years. So a shark that was born the same day as me is just beginning to reach that point where it can have pups of its own. I think I touched on all the questions there. So there's definitely still a lot to learn, um, but it always makes me smile when people are asking the same questions as our researchers, because it really shows that the interest for learning more about white sharks is not just coming from us. It's not just coming from our little sharky nerd hearts, but it's coming from everyone. That's a really good point. It's a really, yeah. really good point. So an, another question is, I have read that orcas, killer whales, have been killing great white sharks in the South Africa region for their livers. Has there been evi any evidence of this type of behavior um, f within the Atlantic great white shark population? Yeah, that is a really awesome question and one that we've definitely been getting a lot more of as some of the news about the South African population has really spread. It's not something that we've ever witnessed here, um, and it's not something that we're really that concerned about because we don't have a steady population of orca whales anywhere near Cape Cod or the hotspots in this region. Um, you know, every now and then we get one or two, you know, a, a small pod or not even a full pod of orca whales passing through the area, you know, a few hundred miles offshore um, or even coming into Cape Cod Bay. I know that happened recently in the past few years, but when we see one or two, you know, it's not a steady presence. It's not something that we've ever seen stick around. Um, and as for the behavior specifically, that's really nothing that we've seen before. Um, especially with the environment that we have, one thing that separates the population in this area from the population down in that area is the way that they hunt. White sharks there are using their incredible propelling from the bottom up and breaching out from the surface to catch seals and other prey items, and the orca whales can take advantage of that as well. Here, they're hunting in less than 10 feet of water sometimes. They're following those seals really close up onto the beach. They don't have the depth to really be using that kind of hunting technique. And the orcas really don't have the breath for that either. They don't have the space. They don't have, you know, the reason to really be in that region either. So at this point, no, it's not something that we've seen before. It's not something that we really expect to see. Um, we hope we don't see it here because um, we know that their shark population has definitely been suffering because of it. All right. Next question is, do you set up your booth um, in the summer on Nantucket Sound or Cape Cod Bay beaches? If you could elaborate a little bit more on which beaches. Yeah. So uh, currently we do not. Um, so our education director works with the town beaches or whoever the jurisdiction might be. So as for now, uh, we run at, let me see if I can get them all right. We have Nauset Beach in Orleans, mm -hmm. um, head of the Meadow Beach in Truro, Newcomb Hollow, and LeCount Hollow, both in Wellfleet, yep. and then um, Coast Guard Beach in East Ham. So okay. right now, I think those are our five beaches. We also might be expanding to Race Point in Provincetown, which I know is a little bit more closer to the bay side. Um, but as for right now, most of them are Outer Cape, as we do see that being that more um, active area for white sharks based on tag detection data. 
Okay. Uh, Richard asks, could you please comment on the presence of sharks along New Hampshire and southern Maine coasts? Yeah, so it's something that we're still learning a lot about. Um, you know, last year, New Hampshire had a couple different receivers along their beach, and those are maintained by the Rye Beach Department or Rye Fire Department, I think. Um, so we hope that we will have that data really soon. It's a really cute cat. <laughs> <laughs> She's a little bit of a gargoyle. I apologize. <laughs> um, so we hope to have that data released really soon. Like I said, we're hoping to have 2022 receiver data pushed out within the next month and a half or so, and that will include those receivers from New Hampshire and the Southern Maine area. Um, they are fewer and far between compared to what we have set up right now on Cape Cod. Receivers are pretty expensive. The whole setup can run us just under $3,000. So as a nonprofit, you know, we need to get that money some, from somewhere. So we do have a lot of amazing sponsors of our receivers who will pay to keep that and maintain that in that area. Um, so, you know, as we just get our familiarization with those different organizations that run and maintain the receivers in New Hampshire and in Maine. We hope that we're learning more, but it is a really new, really new um, relationship for us. Awesome. Um, do you work with Hui at all? Do we work with Hui? There are a couple different ways that we work with them. Um, in the past, Dr. Skomal had worked with them. If you had ever were familiar with, with some of the early Shark Week stuff, maybe you were familiar with like the, it was like a, portable camera that followed sharks. It kind of tuned into it. I forget what it's called now. I think it was literally called Shark Cam. Um, that was a project that Hui and Dr. Skomal were a part of. Um, mm -hmm. We work with Hui in a couple different ways through our education team. So they put on oftentimes a Massachusetts Marine Educators event. Some of our education team is involved in that organization to just kind of share resources, get ideas, and to spread the word about the research that different people are doing. So we aren't running any particular research project projects with Hui at this very moment. Um, but one of our more recent studies that we were a part of was about the perceptions of white sharks, seals, and other wildlife around Cape Cod that Hui, as well as a myriad of other schools and other um, programs were a part of. The next question we have is, the holes on the shark's nose look like sensory receptors. What kind of things do they sense? You're right on the money. They are sensory receptions. And that is actually the shark's special sixth sense. So they have all the same five senses as we do. Um, touch, taste, eyesight, I'm missing it, smell, and hearing. That was really a test for me. Um, and then they have that sixth sense, which is electroreception. So all those little pores that you can see on the shark's nose and around their mouth are called ampullae of Lorenzini. And they are small little gel-filled pores that will pick up on the electrical impulses in the water. They are a super duper fine scale um, reception. So they wouldn't be able to sense an electrical impulse, you know, miles away, but rather it kind of needs to be right in front of their face. So we often don't see white sharks relying on this, we believe, based on their hunting behaviors. But for instance, sharks like the great hammerhead, who kind of use their head almost like a little metal detector, they're looking for prey that's just below the sand or that's flat on the sand, like a flounder or a ray that is really good at camouflage. And with eyes on the side of its head, probably not gonna see its prey all that well. So it's looking for that heartbeat or that muscle movement that's giving mm -hmm. off an electrical impulse through the water and using those ampullae of Lorenzini to get right up close and personal to sense it and grab its prey before the prey can get away. Fascinating. Yeah, there's okay. amazing things going on with the ampullae of Lorenzini that we're yeah. still learning about. There right. are some programs that I'm, I don't remember the, the name of the researcher who's working on it, but they're discovering that, you know, they might even have more receptive properties than we even think. You know, right now we've seen the electrical impulse, but they're starting to discover, you know, they could also potentially be understanding the different ionizations in the water that huh. when that fish, for example, that the shark might be going after is filtering the oxygen out of the water, the water around it becomes, you know, it has less oxygen in it now. Right. So it can actually detect that change in the chemical property of the water. That's beyond even what I can understand, but it's something that, you know, as they look more into it, you know, the research is never done. You know, we can't just say they're electrical impulse receptors and be mm -hmm. done. We got to keep looking. We got to keep digging because you never know what you might learn. That is so cool. That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question. Do you manage the Sharktivity app? Um, me personally, no. Um, but it's also something that's managed in collaboration with the New England Aquarium. Um, so we have some partners over there that will kind of manage the 
um, so I'm looking for the sightings that have been reported mm -hmm. from other people. So from anyone who is in our team, we have like a special username that we use when we sign into the app. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you're just on the beach and you report it and that there's a shark, it will go then to the team over with the New England Aquarium as well as with our team. And we will collaborate together to get a better understanding of, you know, all right, let's reach out to this person. What did you see? Like, do you have pictures? Do you have a video? Do you have any more information you can provide to try to confirm if it was in fact a, sh a white shark that was seen or maybe another species of shark, maybe a mola mola. Lots of folks confuse mola molas with sharks because of that little fin that sticks up out of the water. Um, or maybe it was a whale or another animal. So mm -hmm. by trying to get a better idea of those confirmed sightings, um, we, it is really a collaborative effort. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is a great question. Um, and if, if someone didn't ask it, I was going to ask it. What's your favorite documented shark and why? Ooh, that's tricky. I have a few. I do have love for Snoop Dogg fully because of his name, because I just think <laughs> it's silly. Um, but I also have two favorite sharks that I've, one that I've interacted with in person and one that I've, you know, just seen pictures and working with in an education sense. So the, the first one um, is White Shark Salty, and he is a salty old sailor of a shark. He's been around the block. We have data from him, I want to say dating back to 2014. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think I mentioned when acoustic tags are placed on the shark, they have a battery life of about 10 years. But when research began, it was closer to four or five years. So there are some sharks whose batteries um, they're on their tags have died. And we thought that we just lost touch with them or something. Um, and then we run into them again, them again and realize, huh, that tag is not working. Hmm. Um, so Salty is one of those sharks where he has a really old tag. It's covered in algae growth and things like that. And then he has his newer tag that was put on him. So we're still learning a lot about him, but he's just got all of these funny markings on him. And he's just an old guy that makes his way up along the coast. Um, and my first year working with our ecotourism program, I saw him every day for two weeks straight. And I was like, I like this shark. <laughs> We're friends now. <laughs> um, and then the other one is white shark Aphrodite. We met her in 2020. Mm -hmm. She's the second largest shark that we've ever seen. She was 17 feet long, huge. And she had a lot of really unique and really fresh injuries on her body. Mm -hmm. So she has some really unique markings on her dorsal fin um, that's really recognizable. Mm -hmm. And she also had the top lobe of her caudal fin or her tail completely lopped off. So that was a more fresh injury as well as some um, horizontal markings further down on her tail. And so we do believe that that is most likely from an interaction with a boat or a boat propeller. Mm -hmm. um, and since they were so fresh and since she was so large and it was a beautiful day when we met her, um, our research boat captain, John King, named her Aphrodite, I think because she was so beautiful. But when I asked him about it like a week later, he's like, I don't remember naming her. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully he remembers, but I was inspired. Um, but she is amazing. And with that, then we use her as an example of, you know, a lot of different photos and as well as an example of how all of those unique injuries and scars and markings on her body can be so identifiable. Mm. Um, and we even went so far as to create an 18 foot long educational puzzle that featured her body part. And as a painter by hobby um i got to make that puzzle so i stared at pictures of her for hours on end trying to recreate and do her justice um on a giant puzzle so mm -hmm. very familiar with her <laughs> awesome you guys are bringing that puzzle to the young mariner um programs for that week yes so we I'm are she's so excited <laughs> uh -huh. love it <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question. Can you comment on the great white's ability to control the seal population over the long term yeah, I mean, it's definitely something where they, like I said, have a really tight knit history. They are very dependent on one another because you know, with the presence of seals, we believe comes the presence of sharks. Mm -hmm. um, the important thing to remember is that every ecosystem has a carrying capacity and every ecosystem, you know, and nature just as a whole has a way of balancing things out and keeping that balance. Balance is incredible to nature. It's so important. And that nature, it's not going to let that balance get out of whack without trying to recorrect it. So what I always try to remind people is that, you know, we're seeing all of these white sharks here. And it's a great thing because it's reminding us that this healthy ocean is healthy, that the ocean ecosystem is, is safe and it's balanced. And we wouldn't be seeing an abundance of white sharks if that wasn't the case. 
Um, but what's also important to remember is that, you know, the same goes for seals. They are right below the shark on the food chain. They're pretty, pretty high up there. They're still a predator. And if we couldn't, if our ocean couldn't support the number of seals that we're seeing in this region, it would do something about it. And we've seen it in other, other populations of seals specifically where, you know, an outbreak of a disease might come out and kind of, you know, hinder that population a little bit. So, you know, right now what we're seeing is this really amazing yin and yang of the white shark and the seal. And we're seeing the effects that it has on the other species. And we're seeing how that balance can really, really bring forward a fruitful ocean environment for everyone. Okay. All right. Yeah. And the last question we have is, can you tell us a little bit about Curly? Absolutely. Curly's up there on my list of favorite white sharks, but she, she didn't quite make it because we've got some of those other ones I told you all about. But Curly is probably one of our more famous white sharks. She is featured in our education center, Shark Center Chatham. Um, she is the largest white shark that has ever been documented in the Atlantic Ocean, and she was 18 feet long. Um, now, all these lengths are estimates. We didn't get in the water with her and measure, but, you know, she was up against the boat. She was almost the size of the boat. She was a very large gal. Um, she was estimated to be just about 3,500 pounds, so she was massive. <laughs> um, and Dr. Skomal encountered her in 2010, so they were able to go out. She was actually feeding on a whale carcass, a humpback whale that had died and floated up to the surface. There were a number of different sharks out feeding on that, some blue sharks as well as other white sharks. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much all kind of gave the whale some space when big old Curly started um, making her <laughs> way over to grab a bite. Um, so she got her name from Dr. Skomal because they noticed that her dorsal fin and on top of the back had a bit of a curve to it. And that was kind of unnatural. Most of the time they're mm -hmm. pretty stick straight. It's all cartilage in there. Um, but for whatever reason, it had curved. And so he named her Curly. And at first, they weren't sure if she was female or male, but they were able to get some really great footage. They were able to put a tag on her. They put a special kind of tag that lasted, I want to say, about a year and a half before it came off and we were able to retrieve that information. But it gave us a lot of great information about, you know, where in the sense of what kind of environment she was spending her time. So, you know, what kind of water temperature, water depth. Um, light levels, all sorts of environmental features that let us know kind of where she liked to be and where she spent her time. Hmm. Um, another interesting thing about Curly, and it was actually featured in a Shark Week episode, I think that aired in 2012 on Discovery Channel Shark Week. Um, but Dr. Skomal was able to get in a cage that day. They were out really deep um, and they were off, off Massachusetts state waters. So he got down in a cage with a photographer um, as well. And Curly, being the curious little gal she is, wanted to know what the um, buoys that were holding the cage up were. So for sharks to find out what something is, they take a bite out of it. So she didn't take a bite out of the buoy, but as she was trying to, she got stuck on top of the cage. And naturally, as an animal, when you get stuck, you shake your way out. And with a 3,500-pound shark shaking on top of a cage, the folks in the cage were definitely a little concerned for their safety. <laughs> Um, but she was able to free herself and carry on with what she was doing. She went back to feeding shortly after that. And Dr. Skomal and the photographer were able to get out of the cage. The cage was definitely broken after that. Um, but he still recounts it as one of his most amazing moments. Um, it's actually, he's quoted in our Shark Center exhibit. If you want to come learn more about Curly and see an actual life-size model of her hanging from our ceiling, you definitely come check it out, learn a little bit more, hear directly from Dr. Skomo about it. She wanted to keep everybody on their toes, remind yeah. them who the predator is in the room. Remind her who the boss is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and one final question. Sure. Can you elaborate on injuries from boats? Are boats able to hear or be aware of the shark's locations? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And I appreciate that as you know, a boater, you might be concerned about, you know, how can I make sure that I'm not causing something like that? Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, you know, most boats have no idea when a shark is near them. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, someone who runs our ecotourism program, I have guests where I'm looking at a shark, I'm pointing to it, and my guest right next to me can't see it, let alone the captain who's focused on driving the boat. Um, or sometimes we get some boats who see us and, you know, they're definitely familiar with the behavior of an ecotourism or research vessel. And, you know, they're looking for it and they can't see it. Sharks camouflage is amazing. There's a reason they're an apex predator. There's a reason that they've 
stayed that way since before the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, if you see kind of in this picture right along the face, you see that dark gray become really bright white. And that's where the white shark gets their name is that bright white contrast on their belly. But that dark on top really allows them to blend into the waters around them. And especially if you're just cruising up the coast, you know, you're likely not going to see that shark unless it's right up on the surface. Um, it's happened before where even sometimes we've been out and we kind of skirt all of a sudden turn around. We're like, did we just like, did we just run something over? Like, did we, did we see it? Like, and oftentimes, you know, they're deeper than it looks like, but you can, the ways that the water works and the way that the shark camouflages itself, you know, you're not likely to see it just from your own eye. That's why we use a spotter pilot to find them in the first place. That vantage point is incredible. Um, and it's why you're kind of unlikely to see a shark from the surface or from the beach as well, because that camouflage keeps them so well hidden. I've been here on Cape Cod my entire life, and I sit out on Nosset Beach Orleans where we've tagged sharks, where we've seen sharks very often, and not once in my life have I ever seen a shark from the beach. And it happens to people, I swear, every time I'm not there, it happens to people. <laughs> um, but it's just one of those things where they are incredible stealth hunters, and so mm -hmm. they don't like for people to know where they are. They don't want seals, particularly, to know where they are. Um, so, you know, as a boater, it's not something that we would be able to really, you know, hear them or really make noise unless they're coming out of the water, which is pretty rare. Um, as far as seeing them, like you can always keep your eyes peeled. You never know. Um, the same thing kind of applies for mola mola, which are the giant ocean sunfish, and they do hang out right on the surface. Um, so you are more likely to see a fin or their body on the surface, but they suffer from boat interactions really, really aggressively because they are, they're right on the surface. People don't see them. Um, one thing to note though, is that, you know, while there's really nothing that you can kind of do to prepare for that and to, you know, prohibit that, it's really just a matter of paying attention, situational awareness and hoping that you don't have that incident happen. Um, you know, sharks and mola are honestly so resilient. Um, we can see just by looking at the shark's face, all the markings it has on it, or some of the other ones, or even Aphrodite, who I told you about with half of her tail cut off. She's still swimming. She's totally fine. Like they are able, they have this amazing, amazing healing ability and they are really able to take control of their body and, and keep it going. So as long as they're keeping on swimming, they'll be okay. Just like finding Nemo, keep on swimming. Absolutely. Dory had it right. <laughs> All right, Maddie, thank you so much. This has been amazing. You have thank really you enlightened all. everybody on uh, everybody here on sharks, myself included. Um, awesome. We had some great wait. questions. I appreciate everyone's yeah. questions. I can't wait to uh, see you guys at some point this summer. Of I think course. we're gonna we're gonna take a staff field trip out to you guys. Um, nice. At some point. So yeah. Awesome. Let me know so I can try to be on the premises and not out you on got the water. <laughs> Will do. All right. And thank you again, everyone. Maddie. Um, for everybody on the call, our next Zoom lecture will be next Sunday. That's March 26th. Um, and that will be all about duck decoys. So we're taking a sharp right turn away from sharks and we're going to talk about ducks. Um, so I hope to see everybody there and have a lovely end and rest of your weekend. And thank you again, Maddie. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Right. Thanks so Bye. much.